Are you ready for more Ad Astra? Because I sure am. Ruff, ruff, ruff. Hey guys, it's your boat, Buddha Doggo, and welcome back to Interior. Yes, I'm back to my old intro again. Trying to change the intro uh, was too mind fucking for me. So <laughs> Anyhow, welcome back to Interior. I think it's time for us to get the move on to Lux. Yeah, and Amicus is probably gonna fight or at least meet up with the, the Pugno fighter. So I hope you are as eager to see what happens as I am. So let's go. When I reappear, I'm back at the university, though I'm no longer in the hall. Our guide seems to be in the middle of giving instructions once again, this time about our upcoming departure. It takes a second to reorient myself, and I am a bit annoyed that I've been moved to a different time and place without my knowledge. How did that even happen? Again, the feeling of being a puppet comes to mind. I look over and see Alex standing quietly next to Cassius. I'm still a little bit jarred how quickly the parents agreed to my spontaneous demand. It makes me wonder if it had all been part of that plan. If the parents can kind of, uh, sort of, see into the future, I wouldn't put it past them to have set this all up, to make it seem as if Alex's life was in danger, and that they only took control of my voice so that I'd had that thought process. Then, knowing that I would only demand the traitorous cat's life to be saved, it would lock me back into the plan. The parents only mean well. I quell my anger, knowing that showing my emotions now will only make me look unhinged to the others. I feel Amicus light touch to my shoulder. Are you alright, Bo? Maybe I'm not doing such a good job of hiding my emotions. Yeah, yeah, I... Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Bjarni raises his voice. Now, if that would be all, our ship is ready for departure. The dragon feel his being loosened with relief following the human's departure. It only lasts a second before he returns his irritation to the entities in the plane above him. That was excruciating. The void answers with silence. I know you're listening. If I were you, I'd consider answering at least some of his questions. I doubt this will be the last time he tries this. I'm sure you do, but your failure to keep him safe during his previous directive has left him full of mistrust. And rightfully so, I might add. Yes, yes, you mean well, but my own patience wears thin when I'm made to involve other sapients into your games. Oh, I'm fully loyal to you and the plan. I'm simply warning you that next time, I will not vouch for your benevolence. But consider revealing more to your children, rather than just relying on blind faith and obedience. The ship we fly on is larger and less agile compared to the one that Ambicus uses. It's clunky, and I worry a bit as it takes off, the vibrations and noises making me feel like it's about to break apart in mid-air. None of the others seems concerned though, Nefero using the time to fall asleep, while Virginia seems glued to her tablet. Amicus sits across of me in his own seat, though there isn't much chance for conversation with how loud the aircraft is. He simply reaches across the aisle towards me and our fingers brush briefly before he pulls back and also closes his eyes to get some sleep before our landing. Though I try to do the same, it's difficult with how bumpy the journey is, and the one window I can see only shows a grey overcast atmosphere. So I just sit back and wait. It's not technically a long journey, but because of how uncomfortable it is, it almost feels as long as the flight to Rome had been. Maybe a little more than an hour later, we're alerted by COM to brace for our landing. As the rumbling doubles, I wonder for a moment if accidents are common occurrence on Adastra. But then the shuddering interior of the crash comes to a sudden halt as our landing is surprisingly smooth. I follow everyone else's lead as they undo their safety harnesses, managing to figure it out before Amicus has to help me. I'm ready for him to take my hand, reaching up halfway. 
Then I remember our conversation about not showing affection in public, and I drop it back to my side. As we exit the aircraft, I'm greeted to that grey overcast sky along with jagged snow-capped mountains. Compared with the lush and green fields and forests near Adasra city, the scenery surrounding Lux is about as bleak as I expected. What I'm struck by most, however, is just how cold it is when we exit the aircraft. It's probably above freezing, but with how little clothing I have on, I gasp at the sudden change in temperature. I hear Ambicus move up behind me. Did you sleep well? Not really. Ambicus, I need some more clothing than this. Hmm? The wolf seems confused at first, looking at me with furrowed brows. What's wrong? It's cold. I need something covering my legs and arms. I notice the others looking at me when I feel myself getting a bit red. It's strange that I should feel embarrassed about being underprepared like this when I knew nothing about the place where we were going. But there's something about me being naturally weak as a human that makes me self-conscious. As far as I know, every sibling is equipped with fur that makes an environment like this one no problem for them to withstand. I shiver, and that's when Amicus finally seems to understand. Oh, yes, let's get you to a tailor. Should be one around here, even if it is Lux. What seems to be the issue, Amicus? Virginia looks as annoyed and impatient as usual. And right now, I wish I hadn't said anything, despite the fact that, judging by how cold it is during the day, I'll be dead during the night if I don't put on more layers. Bo needs extra clothing for the weather. He's already shivering. Virginia examines me, as if looking for a reason to be confused with Amicus again, but seems to decide that this is something even she hadn't foreseen. Ah, of course. I imagine the lack of fur would be a hindrance in such a climate. What seems to be the holdup? Is there something wrong with the human again? Cassius shouldn't have the power to embarrass me at this point, but I'm more aware of how I look now that I'm part of an official delegation. But that's when I feel someone stand next to me, and I look up to see Neferu. Actually, I am too very nearly freezing. R really? Do you have fur, Neferu? Yes, I've noticed, but it's much, much shorter than yours. Though I can tell that Neferu is trying to make me feel less self-conscious, I can see that his body is also shivering slightly, and I can hear it in his voice too. Not a problem. A curfew was imposed in the city in preparation for the visit, thus it should not be a problem. In fact, it's best to do it while you make your arrival speech, Amicus. The others will not be present for it after all, aside from Cassius. Are you escorting them then? I was thinking the Kimian ambassador to Adastra might be able to do that. He needs to be more familiar with his fellow Kimian anyway. Where? I'm here. Sorry for being late. Misplaced my damn pa uh, My medications, I mean. A deep, gruff voice comes up from the trail to the landing site, and I look to see a new creature. Well, not completely new. Despite not having heard his voice before, I do recognize the Wolverine. I had seen him at the university about a month ago, but only for a few seconds. Neferu seems to be familiar with him though. Brunis! I was wondering if you'd been dragged into this little outing of your little outing of ours. Of course I was! I was not doing much else on this damn moon after all. Fantastic. Brunis shall be your escort. A escort? For what? These two need a tailor. I don't know what the hell that- Moving on. <laughs> the large bear makes a brisk come on gesture to the rest of the group. Amicus looks unsure what to do, but I give him a reassuring smile. I'll be fine. See you in a bit after your speech, okay? Alright, uh, sorry for not thinking ahead. <laughs> I don't think any of us did. I'll see you again soon. Despite our talk earlier about PDA, Amicus pulls me into a quick hug before letting go. Okay, I trust you are in good hands. Love you. Love you too. Then the greater part of our delegation heads up another trail, towards a smaller grouping of buildings away from the city. What the hell? I don't know where anything is in this city, except for the restaurant where I went to lunch. And by the way, it was the blandest meal I ever had. And since when did I become an escort service? I am the goddamn Kimian ambassador to Adastra! Looks pretty suspicious when they show off the two Kimians and an abandoned alien right at the get-go. Manners, Brunis. 
You haven't introduced yourself to the bow, the abandoned alien. Really, Deferu? You're freezing your ass off! And so is he! I think his lips are turning blue! The Wolverine's much less formal style has me feeling much more comfortable with his presence compared to most others I meet on the moon. Hello, I'm the... I have to think for a moment, since I'm used to being referred to as a pet. The Emperor's Companion! Nice meeting you! And you already heard who I am, huh? Anyway, let's get you some warmth! Bo, do you need to find a shelter? You look to be on the verge of hypothermia! I shake my head as I stomp my sandal clad feet. I'll be good once we start moving. Right, let's get the move on then! I do start to feel a bit better as I copy the quick pace of my two furry companions, feeling more numb than cold as we enter the seemingly deserted city. Meanwhile, the two banter ahead of me. So why the hell did you show up here without the heat source, Neff? I had other matters on my mind, Brunis. Probably not now, eh? <laughs> I assume you have drones? I'd rather not wear woven fashion. Of course I do! Wouldn't want to ruin your pretty looks, would we? D drones? Brunis glances back at me. Yeah, I know they wanted us to take you to a tailor or something, but chemia and climate drones let you control your own temperature and such. Oh! I didn't even think such technology existed. All I saw at the palace was a central climate control. We can get you close if you prefer that. Doubt the tailor would know how the hell to dress you, though. Bo is not simply used to such tech. He's only been exposed to the Volven way of life. Tch, <laughs> shame. Well, we'll show you the way of Kimi and Comfort in a bit. Just gotta go get them in the flat they stuck me in. This would actually be a cool moment where you could choose, maybe, either to get clothes or use the Kimian tech, and maybe that will have consequences in the future when you're having the speech and you either have the Kimian tech with you or you have, like, the woven clothing, and maybe that would change how people see the uh, see us because we have like we are dressed as the wolves or we are using te technology from the Kimians that the wolves already don't really are that fond of. Hmm. Howley, if you're watching this, feel free to use that idea. <laughs> Where did they stick you, by the way? Believe it or not, I think it was a hostel. They cleared out a bunch of wolves right when I arrived. Seems a bit crude. The entire city is! Even by Adastra standards. Pretty sure I walked by a fucking public whipping before the curfew kicked in. And that makes me feel a bit on edge. While it doesn't surprise me, I'd been sheltered by the palace since I got here. As much as it you could be called sheltered anyway. But I've never really been exposed to the Wolven way of life. Brunis lowers his voice. I mean, they're practically barbarians, Nefaru. Don't say that, Brunis. Besides, this area is particularly disadvantaged politically and economically. The Ferris tone is quiet but stern. I know, I know. It's just weird seeing it in person, you know? You also seem to keep forgetting that the Emperor's companion is with us. Brunus looks back at me again. Oh yes, sorry. You're with a Wolf Emperor, right? I wonder what he means by with, but I assume it's a lot, considering that it's fairly common knowledge. I clear my throat. <clears> throat> yeah, but you don't have to censor yourself in front of me. Brunis laughs. <laughs> well, it is my job to be delicate in front of the important people, and I would consider you to be just that. I haven't known you for very long, Brunis, but delicate isn't how I would describe the, um, anything you do. Why is that, Neferu? Because you're so... <sighs> Neferu is a paw in Brunis' general direction. Well, uh, you... What, because I don't do things the traditional way? I did go to Sabiat just like you, Neferu, and I'm pretty sure I got higher rank marks too. Academia isn't quite the same as the real-world application. Yeah, and I've led a few dozen negotiations that resulted in some of the most important galactic treaties being signed. The conversation's sudden turn from friendly to tense is a bit jarring. It's clearly about a lot more than Bruni's delicacy, and I wonder if this is already at the point of contention between them. But as important as this? Brunis is quiet for a moment. You think your brother is trying to fuck this up for you, huh? I kind of wish we'd just gone to a tailor. Being inside someplace warm while being fussed over by another wolf is preferable to being alone with these two bickering Kimians. I did not say- Oh, you said it. You more than said it. If you don't think I'm fit for the job, I'll gladly resign. Did you not want this job? Oh, I want it. 
I've trained my entire life for it. But if my own fellow Kimia doesn't want me here, then that's a piss poor start, don't you think? The silence really drags on now as we turn onto a street that is as empty as the last. I occasionally catch the sight of wolves peering from the windows of balconies, but they quickly disappear as soon as I look up. Haven't you been here a few months, Boris? It seems like you two are only just meeting. I feel the awkward silence, wanting to make myself more part of the conversation rather than being a reluctant eavesdropper. Well, yeah, negotiations got delayed on the Kimian side, and then I got shipped out here for the part of this whole... I don't know, whatever the hell this is. This is the first time we've spoken in weeks. We spoke through the portal several times, Brunis. Wish you would have been a bit more blunt about how you feel about me. I was simply asking a question. You are as informal as they come, and I just find it surprising that you were chosen. Listen, Neferu. Brunis turns to the jackal, and we stop. Yeah, I'm here for a reason. I'm a political statement. I'm a reminder, a scar for the wolves to think about while they negotiate. Now that I'm focusing more on those scars and a prosthetic arm, I'm suddenly realizing who this might be and where he might come from. But I'm also damn good at my job, and I'll be honest when I say that you are not very good at yours. Neferu noticeably bristles, which is what surprises me most about all of this. It is very, very hard to get under Neferu's skin. I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen it happen. I feel bad for Neferu, but he did provoke this argument, and I guess Kimias are supposed to be blunt. So I am here to help you and make this a success so that you are known for more than just getting your nuts cracked. I see Neferu's ears lower even more. Your brother might be an asshole, but he's not stupid enough to jeopardize the entire galaxy just to make you more miserable. After a few seconds, I see Neferu bring his expression into a more natural state, though I can see his eyes flick towards me just for a moment, probably wishing just as much as I do that I wasn't here. I got a vague idea what's going on in your family, and I do think that you got the shortest end of the stick, but that's not important here. Try lowering your voice a bit, Brunis. We have spectators. Sure enough, wolven heads have reappeared at windows and balcony ledges, many of them staring wide-eyed at the three of us. Just know that I'm on your side, all right? Yes, all right. Now let's move before you reveal more sensitive information to random passerby, shall we? Brunis turns and starts walking up the street again. <laughs> they wouldn't know what the hell we are talking about, even if they could hear us, Neff. Again? Don't say such things. I'm not saying that they are stupid, just that they don't have the context to understand any of it. Hell, I bet the Emperor's companion is the same. Brunis turns to me for confirmation. Well... I look around, deciding we're far away enough for the watching wolves not to be heard. I know about the situation with the Alliance, that there are issues between the Pharaoh and his family, and I was actually wondering. Although Brunis isn't looking at me, I can see his ears twitch lower with every word, just as the Pharaohs are coming up. I'm not intending to make him look foolish, but I don't want to be making the impression that I'm a clueless ape either. I've done that for too long on this moon. Are you one of the Wolverines from Deshireth? I'm sorry if I'm being too forward, but I know Kimias appreciates that style of conversation. The fairy side eyes Brunis. Um, yeah, actually. One of the two is still alive. I'm sorry to hear that. It was a terrible thing that happened. Brunis shrugs. Too young to remember much anyway. Surprised you know about it. Sorry, I'm learning about politics and diplomacy and all of that still, so if I overstep boundaries, just let me know. I appreciate it, actually. I would have thought that you learned about what happened on Desherath from a Destron history. We seem to finally reach the Wolverine's flat as we walk around to the back of the two-story building and towards a door that seems to lead down into a basement. I've been supplemented with Kimia recordings as well. <laughs> well, good on ya. We don't even enter the buildings as it rummages around some metal crates right at the entrance, before activating black, dome-shaped drones that float above us. I can already tell that they are far more advanced when compared to Adestron drones, and I'm even more impressed when I feel a warm cone-like shape pour over me. You can adjust the heat with commands from your lingua! I watch Nefero as he seems to squirm in delight at the feeling of his own drone's warmth. So, is this where we are going to be staying? They both laugh. No, you'll have your own living space with the Emperor, likely far outside the city. 
Oh shit, speaking of, I think Amicus Pogna match is going to start soon. Let's pick up the pace and get to the amphitheater. I feel the uneasiness return. Already? Don't we have meetings and speeches to do or something? No, this is what the city cares about the most. If Amicus beats their champion, their only desire for representation will be destroyed. I honestly hope that Amicus is willing to take a fall for our delegation. I'd rather not happen at all. Meh, they like this kind of shit. I'd worry more about one of those famous Lux riots happening while we're here. Their words doesn't offer much comfort as we make our way to the city center. The eyes of the peering wolf seeming to follow us the entire way there. Ambicus stands in the middle of the amphitheater, still seething after Cassius' speech. By any other standard, it would have been a fine speech, something he himself would have been proud of if he had been the one to give it. For Cassius though, it was subpar at best. He'd certainly said what needed to be said, but his usual fire and passion had been absent. While there are no large crowds due to the curfew, it was obvious the Luxians were aware of how lacking the speech had been. Even now, the triumvirs appear slightly perturbed, and Amicus closes his eyes in a quiet frustration as he imagines the ten thousands of citizens listening to the speech in their homes. Still, Amicus knows that he won't be scolding his brother after all is said and done. Cass had not been himself since his poisoning, and Amicus had suspected that what would have been his first speech since that incident would not go well. Amicus also imagines that Cassius having to verbally pledge his support to him only made it more difficult for his younger brother. But now, the exhibition match is already upon him, and because of that uninspiring speech, if he's to quell the city of rebellion's fury. As he warms up, stretching and practicing his stance, he watches his soon-to-be opponent do the same out of the corner of his eye. The old wolf, who had been smiling pleasantly off to the side for the duration of the introductory speech, moves rather slowly, and Ambergus notes his unusual focus on kicks. It's nothing Ambergus hasn't come up in his past matches, and he has little doubt that he can easily crush the old man if he caught him in a grapple. But that wolf is a hero, a champion of these lands. Amicus knows that the consequences of beating him in front of his own people might very well lead to a sudden, unlawful end to the curfew, followed by a riot that would endanger the entire delegation. Amicus glances over where said delegation is seated, and is a bit startled to see Bo sitting down to watch. While he would have preferred that his human not see this match, it still fills him with a burst of energy, intending to show him how physical capable he is. Indeed, Amicus had shown him that plenty of times during their own physical encounters in the bedroom, but that required considerable restraint on his part. As Amicus straightens up, breathing evenly, the older wolf disrobes and finally steps forward to greet his emperor. Amicus already knows him to be Magister, the unusual name having been given to him later in life, indicative of his status amongst the people of Lux. Good day, his imperial highness. I am Magis, your chosen opponent for a friendly bout of Pagno. I would be honored if you were to join me in our proud and ancient sport. If you are ready, your majesty. Amicus nods his head as the old wolf bows low to the ground, sensing only a genuine feeling of goodwill from the other wolf. Of course, Magis. Shall we assume positions? Their style seems to be on opposite ends of the spectrum in Pagno techniques, but Amicus has dealt with such fighting styles in the past, especially from Kato. He doubts this wolf is able to match that warrior's speed and strength. Deciding to make the first move, Amicus rushes in for a tackle, knowing that the takedown would instantly turn the fight in his favor. While he still plans to throw the match, he needs to make it look good. Bo is watching after all and maybe his powerful charge will let the old wolf know that his impending win is artificial. His muscle propels his bulk forward, and in the back of his mind, Ambicus just slightly worries that he might accidentally end the match by crushing the old wolf. <laughs> his rush is brought to an instant and a jarring halt, the jolt emanating through his core before spreading out to his limbs, making him almost fall in half in mid-air. Pressure builds up in his chest, then into his cheeks, which almost humorously swells up before the breath blasts out from his muscles so hard and fast that it makes his lips ripple. It only lasts a few seconds, but Amicus is at least able to understand that he's been viciously kicked in the stomach. 
so hard in fact that Maggie's foot had very nearly disappeared into his belly. Somehow his opponent doesn't bulge in the least bit as he holds steady against Amicus' much larger bulk. And finally the jungle wolf comes back down and lands on weak ankles. Amicus then falls up on the floor of the amphitheater, deafening silence ringing in his ears as he heaves several times, wondering how he had been affected so badly despite being tense and ready. He manages to keep his calm, waiting for his breathing to return to normal, having experienced similar situations during his sparring matches with his father, and then with Kato. In fact, not since Kato has he felt such a breathless agony, but even he had never managed to land such a blow when Amicus had been prepared. The wolf tries not to look towards his delegation, pushing the knowledge from his mind that his human is watching. Finally, he begins to breathe normally and manages to pull himself back up to his feet, trying to muster back his will to fight after having it knocked from him. The older wolf had been slowly moving back and forth in a half circle in front of Amicus, making himself look busy, clearly avoiding a possible grappling situation. The humiliation of the first blow warms Amicus' cheeks and ears, its memory leaving his belly feeling hollowed out. Maybe throwing the match isn't the best idea, not after being done with such ease and knowing that this is being broadcasted to all of Adastra. Ambicus sets his expression into an iron mask of stoic readiness, this time waiting for the old wolf to come to him. Magus does so slowly, and the second he's within reach, his foot flies up again. Time slows for Ambicus as his eyes flick to the sudden movement. The wolf knows he's not in the best shape, his training time having been completely shallowed by the Imperial duties. Still, some skills never left one's mind after learning them. He's reminded of this as muscle memory kicks in and catches the lightning quick attack. Instinct takes full control and Ambicus begins to prepare his next attack, one which will bring the fight to the ground where he knows he will have a significant advantage. The man can kick, and that's for certain, but even now, Ambicus can feel his own muscles and strength overcoming anything the older wolf is trying to bring against him. His foot is stuck and he isn't getting it free unless Ambicus lets him. The younger wolf spots the one foot the other wolf is balanced on, preparing to sweep it from under. Time slows once more, but this time Ambicus can't do much more as the older wolf uses the support Ambicus is giving him and swings up the other foot. Both of Ambicus' paws are occupied. He can only watch as the foot sails his way. Ambicus has just enough time to realize it's over when... Ambicus' vision flashes white, the foot whipping into his muscles so hard and fast that it doesn't hurt at all. Instead, a numbling feeling is left behind as the younger wolf is stunned. Time is still slow, dragging out his defeat longer than he'd like. He has a moment to see his crown flash in the dull sunlight. Ambicus decides that this is rather appropriate for as badly he'd been beaten. Again, Ambicus is hit with not just a wave of pain, but one of familiarity. The feeling of confusion, followed by squinting at the sky. It had been a good while since he had been knocked unconscious, and he doesn't miss the feeling. He does savor it for a moment though, having enough sense to know that something humiliating is awaiting for him on the other side of his consciousness. See in Magus, Ambicus is reminded of what happened, and he groans internally. It lasted about as long as an average match, though the kick at the beginning was certainly something that would have been hard to live down. It would likely be replayed on the news channel over and over, similar to Nefarious clash with Kato. Sure, he could ban it, but that would only confirm him to be as humiliated as he feels right now. It's made only worse as Magus approaches and kneels before him. Your Imperial Highness, are you alright? Ambicus stares for a moment trying to judge the other wolf's intentions. That's important now that he's sure to be part of the delegation. But again, rather than sensing any malicious intent to further humiliate the younger wolf, Ambicus only sends a genuine feeling of respect. Quickly, the Emperor rides himself, taking his crown from the older man. Uh, thank you, thank you. Good spar, Magus. Indeed, your strength was quite formidable. I very nearly lost the match at the end there. Ambicus tries to smile through the aftermatch pleasantries, finally sparing a glance towards Bo. His expression is hard to read, but when he catches Ambicus' eyes, he gives him a smile. It's tight and concerned, 
but it still surprises the young wolf. It's as if he's trying to let Amicus know that it's okay that he lost, that he's only concerned for his well-being. Still, he can't stop his muscle from burning slightly, even as he stretches a paw out towards the human, indicating he should join him at the amphitheater. I see Amicus' invitation to join him and quickly take my place by his side. I can tell that he's embarrassed right now. Of course he would be after what happened, but I'm just glad to see that he's mostly okay after the brutality of the fight. I know him well enough to keep my concerns and affection in check for now, instead letting everyone play it off like nothing happened. The others follow me, introducing themselves one by one to the older wolf. While Virginia had watched the entirety of the fight with hardly any expression, I was a bit surprised as he cast his slow his eyes when it became clear Amicus was losing. I assume he might take pleasure in seeing his emperor brother get troused, but he just seems to have been made uncomfortable by the whole thing. Meanwhile, Nefera had watched with an expression that seemed on the verge of disgust, while Brunus visibly cringed and shook his head throughout. As for me, I just feel relieved weakness flooding through my limbs after the surge of adrenaline during the fight. It was the feeling of dread and terror that I felt a few times, specifically when seeing Amicus and Kato fight. It made me wonder if I can ever watch another Pugno match again. Amicus places his paw around my shoulders, grunting slightly as he pulls me into his side and fixes a tight smile on his face. Anyways, we're glad to have you as a part of our delegation, Magis. I'm glad to be part of it. I only regret that it was under such circumstances. Amicus shrugs his shoulders quickly. If it was only under the circumstances of friendly sport, then I'm glad to have experienced it. Indeed. And despite his brutality in Pagni reminding me of Kato, he doesn't seem anything like that old wolf. Indeed. Luckily, the itinerary anticipated your inclusion. Thus, plans should remain the same. Would you like to go over the schedule with me? Oh, definitely. I trust that you remember the way to the villa, Amicus? The trolls have been instructed to keep anyone from following you or your companion. Of course. Thank you again for the bout, Magis. I look forward to having more formal meeting tomorrow. Amicus nods his head at Magis, and I take that as my cue to bow at Old Wolf. And he responds by making sure to bow lower than me. Yes, until then, your highness. And his companion. With that, the formality seems to end, and I feel Amicus steer me towards one of the exits to the city square. After we pass under a few arcways, along with a few more eyes peering from windows, we emerge into the outskirts of Lux. The cold grey walls give way almost instantly to the rolling hills and jagged mountains of the tundra beyond. I feel Amicus practically deflate against me, and I feel a wave of sympathy for my wolf as I realize how much that fight must have weighed on his mind. I raise a hand to touch his bulky furry arm that's already around me, not saying anything for now waiting for him to talk if he wants to. He grunts again, rubbing my arm. <laughs> well, uh, aren't you nice and warm? He turns his eyes up towards the drone above me. Kimian tech, eh? Yeah, that ambassador Brunis gave it to me. Ah, yes, he's an incredible man. Was your time with him pleasant? I shrug. It was alright. Not much going on, considering the city is basically a ghost town. Yes, the red street where the curfews and such is the product of being such a rebellious city. I see. We walk in silence for a few minutes, and I look ahead to the neat layout of the villa at the end of the trail, maybe a mile outside of the city gates. Around us are a few other isolated buildings and trails, maybe something that looks like a farm, though I had no idea what they would grow up here. Still, I can't see anyone else around us. As it becomes clear Amicus isn't going to say anything, I give in. So, um, are you feeling okay? Should we have a doctor look at your head? I focus on Amicus' physical condition, rather than the state of his pride. No, no, of course not. Just a bit sore here and there. Okay, that's good, I guess. It's quiet again. Then Amicus sighs. <sighs> I'm sorry. I sigh as well. <sighs> For what? For my failure and for my failure in combat. I underestimated my opponent, but I promise to become stronger in the future. But why are you apologizing to me? Because, as your partner, your future husband, 
I not only embarrass myself in these situations, but I risk doing the same to you. I absorb that, keep my frustration at those words in check. Amicus, I'm not embarrassed. I was terrified for you, and now I'm just relieved that you seem to be okay, and that is over. That's all I feel right now. You must be slightly embarrassed for me, no? No. This time Amicus sighs in frustration. <sighs> Sometimes I think you say things only because it's the correct thing to say in your culture. You emphasize me being an individual and dismiss your own feelings as unimportant. That kinda hit me as a player rather than a character, damn. <laughs> I stay quiet. Bo? Yes? Do you... have anything to say to that? I don't know, I'm just not sure what to say. Is what I just said that bad? Maybe. I just feel like you're dismissing my own feelings right now. How so? By accusing me of saying things because of my culture and not because it's how I actually feel. It was almost as bad as watching those fights you had with Kato. I couldn't care less about you being in Paris right now. Oh. Well, you know the situation is completely different. <sighs> yeah. Our conversation seems to end there. The villa only a few minutes away now. I'm okay with letting it go. Too tired to argue right now. Amicus squeezes me to his side again. Well, listen. The hard part is over here in Lux. Over the next two days, we can do whatever we like. I feel like I've heard Amicus say that more than a few times. And it always seems to not quite work out that way. You sure your duties won't pop up? Well, here and there. But I've arranged them to call me through my portal. As much as a struggle it is to use one. Do you have things planned? Yes. Tomorrow we visit the famous natural springs in the mountains. Just us two. That does sound kinda nice. Alright. And Bo, I I'm sorry again. I'm simply sulking after being beaten so badly. I'm not going to ruin this trip. I look up at my wolf, letting the hurt I felt a few minutes ago fade into the background. I'll hold you to it. For now, I assume there's a bath in the villa? Then maybe I can give you a massage like old times. Oh, well... The wolf rubs his stomach. Definitely wouldn't mind that right now. It's a date then. Indeed. Amicus stops at the door of the villa, then leans in to kiss me, and we kiss for a long time, with no prying eyes around to disturb us. And that's the last interior update we have so far, as for recording this video. I am very much enjoying this story so far. And it's gonna be fun to see the other two cities as well, so... Yeah. And uh, interesting to see more characters. I wonder how many characters are gonna be, be at the end. So how many voices will I have to keep in mind? <laughs> Maybe I will do Kimia soon. We'll see. Since Kimia is in hiatus, I don't know if I should wait with Kimia until they start updating that again, or if I will do that soon. We will, I will think about that. But anyhow... Big thank you to all of my patrons, people on the Discord server, you for watching, you for commenting, you for living and like. I love you all. So yeah, take care guys, and remember that you are loved and appreciated, and that you should be proud of who you are, because I want to see you in the next episode. Oh, that old outro, that, that felt good. <laughs>